Good afternoon, welcome to you all. My name is Tracy Metz. I'm going to be your moderator today and I'm very honored to have been invited to be a part of this special occasion with Dr. Kim. I'm a journalist and author. I'm also the director of the John Adams Institute, which brings the best and brightest of American culture to the Netherlands. And today is certainly no exception. This is the first Youplange Institute lecture. And as you know, it will be given by Dr. Jim Kim, president of the World Bank Group, himself a physician and passionately interested in the future of global health and the role of finance in that future. The video work you saw as an introduction was by Helene Blanca. A practical announcement, please don't forget to turn on your phone again after the event. And in the meantime, do feel free to Twitter about it with the hashtag JLI and hashtag Jim Kim. We will first have a few words of welcome by Christian Rehberger, the Director General of International Cooperation at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Rehberger is here as a representative of the Dutch government, which is hosting Dr. Kim on this official visit. And the ministry is also an important supporter of the Joop Lange Instituut, and it's in particular its academic chair at the University of Amsterdam. Mr. Rehberger, may I give you the floor? Well, thank you, uh, Tracy, and good afternoon to you all, and especially to you, Dr. Kim, also on behalf of the Dutch government, and we're very happy to have you here in the Netherlands, um, and um, it's very happy also to have you here to deliver the Joop Lange Lecture, organized by the institute that was recently founded to commemorate the work of Joop Lange. And as the invitation says, it's in the spirit this institute combines science, activism, and pragmatism to work on global health and reach the goal of making health markets work for poor people. Ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon we will focus on global health threats. Ebola and Zika have once again shown that such health risks are not just local. They have or can become global risks. And there's more of these global risks, or global public goods, as you may say. Climate change, migration, instability, issues that affect us here in the western part of the world. And it shows, as my Minister for Foreign Affairs, Bert Koenders always said, that foreign affairs have become national affairs, and vice versa. And at the same time, if you then look to the news, you look about Brexit, you hear about migration, and what we call the Mediterranean route, we see that a lot of people here in Europe more and more tend to focus on those issues within the borders of their own country. As if trade barriers would help create economic growth, or if closing borders would be the only remedy to stop migration. So your presence here, Dr. Kim, and your messages on Dutch television last night are a welcome counterweight to that. Ladies and gentlemen, Regarding this afternoon's theme, I have to admit that I'm an optimist by nature. I'm heading the Dutch development, and development in itself is something which is about progress, about opportunities. And if you look to the progress we've made as mankind, you can only be inspired. Just to remind you, I think in October last year, Dr. Kim, you announced at uh, meetings with the World Bank that the number of people living in extreme poverty around the world has been halved, halved in 25 years fall on the 10% of the world population. And if you look to the field of health, new HIV infections fell by approximately 40% between 2000 and 2013. And between 2000 and 2013, tuberculosis prevention, diagnosis and treatment interventions saved an estimated 37 million lives. And the mortality rate fell by 45%. Progress, ladies and gentlemen, made possible through a combination of international cooperation good policies and innovation. For instance, through development of vaccines and the implementations of massive vaccination programs. But next to an optimist, I'm also a realist. And it's clear we face some serious challenges in development and in global health. I'll say two things and then I stop. First is to address them properly, we should realize that they have a lot to do with inequality, social 
cultural, economically, and gender-based. And although inequality between countries is fading, inequality within countries is growing. And diseases like HIV, AIDS, and malaria are what we call discriminatory, racist in a way, because they disproportionately affect those who have no access to medicine, to vaccines, to prevention activities. So unless we fight inequality, we will not be able to get universal access to help in 2030. And then on delivery. The billion dollar question is then, how can we deliver to promises made in the framework of the SDGs? And in that sense, I think we can learn a lot from Joop Lange, a true leader in global health. And I remember him visiting 10 years ago, our office in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, questioning why do we put all our efforts in public health systems in developing countries? You're ignoring the fact that 60% or more of all health services in, in, for instance, Africa are delivered through the private sector. Use it, use their knowledge, use their finance, the innovation power of the private sector. And you led by example. Through Pharma Access, he started the health insurance fund, offering health insurance for poor people by supporting local insurance companies. And Yup is also one of the brains of the Medical Credit Fund, which provides access to finance for small and medium healthcare providers. So okay, they can actually deliver their health services to poor people. The Netherlands has supported these initiatives by providing seed money, small guarantees, which have enabled them private investors to come in and to actually co-invest in Africa. And we're really happy that we've done this work together with the World Bank Group. We've joined many of these efforts. For instance, in Nigeria, the Health Insurance Fund has really benefited from the partnership for the IFC in their Health in Africa initiative. But now, if we want to scale up, we really have to intensify our collaboration if we want to reach the global goals in 2013. And as you always say, Mr. Kim, the, we have to get from the billions to the trillions if we really want to make the progress. We, use, we need, cannot only depend on public money. We need to use the public money to leverage more private money. And we need the innovation power of the World Bank, as you've shown, for instance, with the pandemic emergency finance facility. So, I'll stop here, Dr. Kim. I look forward to your lecture and I look forward to the continued partnership between the Netherlands and the World Bank. Thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.
So beautiful, so beautiful. These are dancers from uh, Nederlands Danstheater 2. 
NDT2, which is the youth company of the Nederlands Dans Theater, NDT, uh, the stars in their fields to be. The dancers that you saw are Alexander Anderson from the US and Katharina van der Waller from Belgium. The piece that you saw is called Schubert and it was created by the house choreographers of NDT, Paul Lightfoot and Sol Leon on the occasion of their 25th anniversary of working together in 2014. The dancers have just returned from a trip to Lublin and Warsaw and leave again tomorrow to perform at the Pohoda Festival in Slovakia. Life's not easy as a dancer and to see such beautiful work, very inspiring, a wonderful image of the future. Thank you. <laughs> May I invite to the stage Ono Schellekens, Ono is the chair of the Joop Lange Institute, and I have a couple questions for him. Welcome, Ono. Thank you. Join me. The goal of the Institute is to make health markets work for the poor. What does that mean in practice? Well, um, when Joop uh, Lange did his uh, did, did the mother child transmission studies in 94 95 he really demonstrated with with others but he was one of them that uh, it was possible to turn the disease from deadly into chronic and um, since that moment I think it was really relevant that that happened that moment because it also changed the nature of the disease from something that is quite extravagant and homosexuals in New York and Amsterdam and New York. Always about other people. Yes, it is about other people and suddenly babies were, you know, suffering from this. So um, it, it, it made clear that in developing countries there's a huge uh, problem and it can be addressed and it took 10 years before the first public money became available. Dr. Kim was one of the activists uh, Joop Lange was one of the activists, Mark Diebel, Peter Piot, all those guys, they were trying to change the system. Uh, but in those 10 years, those people, before the public money was coming in, they were relying on markets. And I think that is the foundation of what we're trying to do. You have to accept that if the best doesn't work, then often the people that are really suffering, they are relying on markets instead of uh, social infrastructure. And I think that is what we want to address, that is what we want to work on, that's where we want to you know, take that starting point further and further and further. So uh, out-of-pocket expenses, very, very high. The poorer the country, the higher the out-of-pocket expenses for healthcare within a country, uh, the poorer the people are, uh, the higher the out-of-pocket expenses very often. And markets so that's why we want to bring those people into the system give them more attention and build inclusive healthcare. and how do you do what you do well that's also not easy but uh, we we'd like to pay more attention focus much more again on those market mechanisms when do people save when do people prepay how can we bring systems from post payment to prepayment um, what is the psychology of paying for each other? Which incentives should you use for that? On the, the, the supply side of healthcare, is it possible to invest? How can you invest? How do you improve quality? How can you make contracts to make it work? How can you introduce and embed interventions in those public kind of systems and bring it to a more inclusive market? That's really our agenda. And very much also on mobile, using of new technologies to bring healthcare together. And this is the first Joop Lange Institute yes. lecture. Why is Dr. Kim the ideal person to do that? Well, I was dreaming of it, <laughs> uh, of course, because I think uh, when, when, when we had the remembrance in the AMC, uh, uh, I think a year, uh, one and a half year ago in October uh, 2014, um, at the end I had the chance to say something and it's really what I believe. Uh, personally, I have seen people that change the world are very often doctors and especially doctors that can also understand money and have an intention on this combination and they have the moral authority 
to push the limits of health and social infrastructure. And Dr. Kim is leading this today, I would say, and he has, he has been an activist. I think it's a little bit uh, difficult to admit nowadays when you're the establishment, but he was a very much an activist trying to, you know, to push and change the world of global health. And I still think he's, you know, the fact that he was willing to do this, I was emailing with him as a Mickey Mouse with uh, uh, Dr. Kim. I think it's fantastic that he's doing this. So, you know, we cannot have a better start than this. Mickey Mouse? I am, yes, uh, we are. <laughs> but uh, that somebody like uh, Dr. Kim is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, committing to uh, help this agenda for is fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Onos Schalkens, chair of the Joop Lange Institute. <laughs> it's time. I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Kim. So we have, a, we have a little bit of a technical problem here in getting the slides up. Um, but I, let me start by saying that it's a, it's a tremendous honor for me to be here. I, I knew you very, very well. And it's also true uh, that I was an activist. Now, one of the things is I said I would, I would talk about global health, but I insisted that I would not dance. Uh, and, <laughs> and I wish I looked like the male dancer with my shirt off. I don't, I tell you uh, right now. But for the students, when I was president of Dartmouth College, I actually did dance on stage. And if you Google it later, Jim Young Kim, time of my life, <laughs> I, I, I danced and rapped to the Black Eyed Peas version of time of my life. So please look at it, but after the lecture, OK? Um, and, and I'm so glad that the students are here today. And uh, you know, it's, it's um, it's really important to remember the people who are involved in something that fundamentally changed the world. And Yub Langa was a person who fundamentally changed the world. And it's hard, it's hard to understand where we were um, uh, in, in uh, the late 1990s. You know, I started medical school in 1982. And the, um, the phenomenon of HIV AIDS was really first noticed about a year before, 1981. And in, when I started medical school, we still didn't know uh, what the cause of HIV AIDS was. We didn't know if it was airborne. We didn't know if you uh, could uh, become infected if you were near somebody. We didn't know if you just touched somebody. And so we had these first experiences with patients living with HIV AIDS, and it was frightening. We would put on hazmat, basically full coverage, almost like astronaut suits, to walk in there. And so for someone like you to have taken this on at an early point in his career, he really was making common cause with some of the most ostracized, marginalized people. At first, they talked about the 4-H club, Haitians, because the incidence was very high for some reason in Haiti, homosexuals, hemophiliacs, uh, and I forgot the fourth H, but... Uh, uh, heroin users, right? So uh, this was, this was uh, a group of people that were thought of as the most ostracized and despised people in the world. Yup, Yup was a huge, huge, huge advocate, and he took that on. He saw around corners. Now, we at the World Bank Group, so I was actually a protester of the World Bank Group. I was part of a, of a movement called 50 Years is Enough. And uh, in 1994, our mission was to close the World Bank Group and the International Monetary Fund on its 50th anniversary. We thought it was, there was a nice kind of uh, a symmetry, 50 years, and then close the institutions. I wrote, uh, or I, was, I, was, I, I edited a book called Dying for Growth, Global Inequality and the Health of the Poor. In it, it was really a 500-page with uh, hundreds of pages of nerdy footnotes arguing that the World Bank Group had actually um, uh, 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 done damage to the health of the poor. And the argument at that time was the World Bank was too focused on simple GDP growth and, and did not focus enough on investing in human beings. Well, I'm very happy to say that we lost that argument. The World Bank and IMF did not close. 
And the great thing about the World Bank and IMF is that it's based on evidence. We have to, uh, you know, at the World Bank Group anyway, around development, we focus on evidence. We have two goals. One is to end extreme poverty, and we didn't do this just haphazardly. We did it in a very focused way. We want to get it below 3%, because you can't stop the natural disasters in the world that bring people in and out of poverty. So below 3% uh, by 2030. I'm a big believer in goals. We set a goal with a, with a deadline for HIV. It made a big difference. But also, for the first time in history, the World Bank is tackling uh, inequality. And so we worked and worked and worked in, on this. And we decided that what we were going to focus on is boosting the income and the well-being of the bottom 40% in developing countries. Now, uh, one of the things we know is that economic growth alone, and this was the argument that my group was having with uh, the World Bank group. Will GDP growth alone solve all the problems of the world? And what we know is that it's extremely important. Pro of all the uh, poverty reduction, and it's actually even better than Christian said, uh, back in 1990, uh, more than 40% of the people in the world were living in extreme poverty. And as of 2015, it's less than 10%. So there's been tremendous progress. A lot of it, uh, frankly, most of it in China. China lifted 600 million people out of poverty, and in China, it was mostly economic growth. Uh, but the living standards of the bottom 40% lag behind. Uh, we know it's not enough. We know that unless there are fo uh, programs focused on investing in human beings, for example, without those, we'll never get to the 3%. So the 3%, getting below 3% is a huge challenge for the global community. Good jobs are the key. Now, this is what is worrying everybody. Um, if there's one group of people in the world who've not benefited from globalization very much, it's the middle class in the high-income countries. And so this is what you're seeing. Brexit was an ex expression of that uh, uh, middle class uh, disappointment. And uh, you're also seeing a very similar phenomenon in the United States. How do you create those good jobs, especially in a context in which Artificial intelligence, robotics, 3D printing, nanotechnology are becoming more and more important. So what, do, what are we to do? Uh, there is unrest in Europe, there's unrest in the United States, in the most developed countries. There are literally billions of people who want to have a chance to live like everything else, everyone else. If there's one thing that's changed, everywhere I go, people have smartphones. And people can look at their smartphones and they can see in front of their eyes how the rich live in the rest of the world. Uh, in the highlands of Bolivia, in the slums of uh, Delhi, everyone knows how everyone else lives. I was born in 1959 in Korea. In Korea, in 1959, was one of the poorest countries in the world. The World Bank reports from 1960, 61, 62 on Korea, I, I, I got those from the archives, and it said Korea was a hopeless country. No way it can grow. Uh, they don't have enough Western influence. Their Confucian culture holds them back. Uh, the uh, literacy rate was relatively low, less than 20%. Number of college-educated people was less than 10%. Korea has no hope, and they did not even qualify in the 19, early 1960s for the most concessional World Bank loan, the IDA loan. It wasn't until 1964 that they qualified for IDA loans. I immigrated to this country in 1964, and uh, through those years, from 64 to when I went back for the first time to Korea in 1984, of course, Korea exploded. But the bottom line is, everyone in the world wants to have that experience. There's not a country, there's not a people in the world who don't want that experience of going from being one of the poorest countries in the world to having a chance to live a middle-class life like they see on their smartphones. Now, many, many global risks. Um, uh, Christian and others talked about some of them. Uh, economic growth is slowing. It, our latest uh, estimate was 2.4% globally. Uh, we'll see what happens with Brexit uh, if, we have to, uh, if we have to push down our projections even more. Forced displacement, the most people displaced since World War II. Climate change, and for you young people, I'm telling you, this is very, very real, and it's worse than we thought. Every time we look, it's worse than we thought it was going to be. We thought that the things that we're seeing now wouldn't happen until much higher temperatures. From about uh, September, October until about April, every one of those months was the hottest month on record for that month. Uh, 
what do we do? Uh, we have now become the largest funder of climate change-related activities in the world, and by 2020, uh, we will provide a, uh, as much as $29 billion a year for climate change. It's real. We can talk about that later. Pandemics. You know, we, we, uh, uh, we saw with uh, Ebola that it was too late. The epidemic started in, in December of 2013. Real money did not flow to fight Ebola until October of 2014. Right. So we created a facility that now will release money immediately for any problem, and, and it's linked to an insurance instrument and a bond. And this is, this is the thing that's changed most for me. Uh, I came into this uh, job, uh, and I have to say, I'm still, I'm still an activist. Uh, don't tell everybody at the World Bank, but I'm still an activist. But here's what I've learned. What I've learned is that finance is incredibly powerful. It's, it's, it's perfectly in line. I mean, you've had this insight about uh, the power of finance before, before most of us, but it's what I've learned. In other words, uh, there are so many ways that rich people have to make themselves richer, and these things are completely legal, and they work. And what we at the World Bank do more than anything else is we try to use those instruments on behalf of the poor. If there's any... Uh, I don't know that there's any greater inequality in the world between the rich and the poor than access to insurance. Everyone in this room, I'm guessing, has uh, uh, free access to health care. 100 million people a year are impoverished because of lack of access to health care and, 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 and catastrophic health care payments. We, are, uh, we put together an insurance instrument linked to a bond. People can actually invest in pandemic response. And these are this now... This, this instrument that we put together is the first instrument in history that will release money automatically once certain pandemic triggers are activated, once we get to certain triggers. And so in this particular instrument, it would have released in July. The, the cash window would have released in December, uh, 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 if, if necessary, to try to stop it at its root, but the insurance instrument would have released in July, uh, four months before actual money was released, and in that four-month period, the number of Ebola cases went up 10 times. So uh, we are going to do everything we can to use the instruments, swaps, uh, loans, blended finance, uh, guarantees, uh, using risk capital to lower the risk of a deal so that private sector investors can get involved and help to achieve uh, 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 development targets. And the other major problem that I'm going to talk to you about a lot today is uh, the crisis of childhood stunting. Stunting is just um, a proxy indicator that children who don't grow 25 centimeters in the first year and 12 centimeters in the second year, if there are two standard deviations below that for their particular country, we say that the children are stunted, but it's really a proxy indicator for poor nutrition, lack of stimulation, sometimes being in toxic environments, uh, but it also has implications for their brain, which I'll tell you about. So in investing in health is really important. I want to thank the Dutch government for supporting uh, institutions. You know, I used to come to, to the Netherlands all the time. Um, uh, I worked with KNCV, Kitty is here in the audience. I worked with uh, IDA, the International Dispensary Association. In fact, the International Dispensary Association was critical in helping us lower the price of drugs for drug-resistant tuberculosis and eventually for HIV. Uh, but we know that it's a driver of economic growth, and we didn't really have this evidence before. Great economists like Amartya Sen would say, the countries that invest in their people in health and education do better economically. But the connection between the two was not so clear. Uh, Larry Summers uh, did this study and found that between 2000 and 2011, 24% of full growth, uh, 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 growth in full income, which means growth in GDP, plus the benefits of the extra life years. You put those two together, 24% of that benefit came from better health outcomes. So now we know that there's a direct co connection. If you invest a dollar in health in a middle-income country, uh, the, the uh, payback over time is 9 to 1. If you invest in a lower-income country, the payback can be as much as 20 to 1. We need to, make, we need to continue to make these investments, and I'm going to argue today that these investments in human capital are probably the most important investments that any developing country can make right now to make a difference in their ability to compete in a future economy which we're beginning to have some sense of, of, of what it will look like. Uh, now, in order to get 
uh, to where we want to get. In order to take, tackle the problems of our time effectively, we have to think differently. Now, uh, one of the things that, that I did, I've been very interested in behavioral economics. Behavioral economics is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a very interesting new field. And the reason it's so interesting is it's, fu it's questioning fundamentally the assumptions that uh, economists have made, that, that you know, the rational the rational uh, person, the, you know, that the, the people make decisions in an economy based on rationality is coming under uh, scrutiny. They weigh their choices, they consider all the information, they make decisions individually. Well, this World Development Report, which is our flagship report, argued that people actually don't think like that. People think quickly, they make quick decisions. Two, people think socially. People are deeply affected by the way that people around them think, and finally, People think according to mental models. They have ideas in their head about what they should do or about what the right answer is, and that's how they make choices. Now, let's look at, um, at, at one particular mental model that Youp fought uh, from the very beginning, and this was the notion that treatment for HIV uh, in Africa was impossible. Now, you know, for the young people, I just want you to understand, I'm sure it's hard to, hard to get, this, get this in your head. Uh, uh, AIDS, when it came, when we understood it in 1981, was universally fatal. There were a few people who lived for a long time with HIV, very few, but just about everyone died. And so from 1981 until 1996, it was just a nightmare. Uh, it, you just couldn't believe uh, how uh, awful this was, that if you were infected with HIV, it was a death sentence. In 1996, uh, because of great research that was done, um, really almost, almost forced to be done by activists, and I'll show you a slide of that later, uh, there was treatment for wealthy countries. 1996, HIV transformed from a disease that was an automatic death sentence to one that was really a chronic disease. And I have friends who were infected very early, who became uh, HIV positive very early, who are alive today and doing very well because of the medicines that we, uh, and, the, and the treatment regimens that we found in 1996. But for Africa, this was as recent as 2003. This is what people were saying. Just to give you a, 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 um, a sense, one of my uh, uh, colleagues at the World Bank did an article, he was a journalist, and he talked to the head of, a, of, a, of, a, um, of USAID, let's just be frank about it, and, uh, and uh, this person, the head of USAID, said that you know, um, Africans don't know what Western time is. You have to take these uh, drugs a certain number of hours each day. They, or they don't work. Many people in Africa have never seen a clock or a watch their entire lives. And if you say one o'clock in the afternoon, they do not know what you're talking about. They know morning, they know noon, they know evening, they know the darkness at night. So um, uh, some, African, um, uh, some African government officials said, well, you know, that person visited us uh, you know, several months ago, and the only one who was late for every meeting was him. <laughs> this is what passed for policy. We had a life-saving medicine, and people, some of the people who I respect most in the world in the global health field were saying, you know, uh, treatment's not going to be possible. All the 25 million people in Africa who we think are uh, living with HIV AIDS, I'm sorry, but you're all dead. So along with Youp, um, and, and I have to tell you, there's a lot of revisionist history going on. Everyone now remembers themselves as an AIDS activist advocating for treatment. That was not true. You was one of the very few scientists who was out there saying that we should treat everybody very early on. And it was the activists more than anything else, but we had experience. I was part of an organization called Partners in Health where we started off uh, treating HIV the minute there were drugs available. Uh, we just scraped together pennies. We got uh, drugs from voluntary organizations, and what we saw was the same miraculous uh, Lazarus effect, we called it, of HIV treatment in developing countries. And so we were convinced, and working with IDA, the International Dispensary Association, I had learned that the actual cost of manufacturing these drugs that were on sale for 12 to 13, 14, $15,000 a year, the actual cost of manufacturing was nothing. The reason they were expensive is because they were still on patent. So we, uh, we said, well, then there's no reason why we can't get around these patents and provide these to everybody. But the problem here, and what you see on this screen, is the mental model was that it's too complicated. It's just too difficult. 
Africans don't know time. It's going to take attention away from pre prevention. And frankly, 99.9% .9 of all public health officials were against HIV treatment in Africa. 99.9% .9 of all public health professionals were saying to the 25 million people in Africa living with HIV, you are dead. Now, it's hard to imagine. How can that have been? Young people, you're sitting there, well, come on, how could that have been? That's exactly what the situation was. It was the same for drug-resistant tuberculosis when we started treating that in developing countries. Kitty remembers that very, very well. It was the same for that situation. And so we felt our inspiration was not uh, being rational. Our inspiration was not being reasonable. Our inspiration was that in every generation, you have these issues that you have to understand are going to define your generation. If we had let 25 million people in Africa die first, we would not have had 5 to 6% growth rates in Africa over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, every, the people would have, be, would have been dying right and left, and nobody would know their status. Why would you get tested if the only thing that happened from knowing that you were HIV positive is you'd be stigmatized? No one was getting tested, no one was getting treatment. When I went to the World Health Organization, my very good friend, J.W. Lee, out of the blue, um, a, a um, really a vaccine guy, medical doctor, a fellow Korean, uh, became director general of the World Health Organization, and he asked me if I'd want to come and work with him. And I said, I will come if we can set a global target for treating HIV AIDS. And so we set one. In 2003, we said, we're going to get 3 million people on treatment for HIV by 2005, two and a half years later. It was the most outrageous goal that had ever been set. Uh, but, and, and, and when we set that goal, it wasn't just that people were saying, well, you know, that's nice, you guys are being ambitious, that, you know, we'll see if we can get there. That's not what happened. People were furious at me. The, the, the donors were furious. The ministers of health of African countries were furious because they were saying, how can you put so much pressure on us when there's no money and we don't have the drugs? But I believed at that time that unless you set a goal that has aspirations that meet the aspirations of the poor, that you are not serious about fighting poverty, about uh, treating HIV AIDS. That's the challenge. Are our goals and our aspirations equivalent to those of the poor themselves? Youp did so many things. Uh, he changed the way we, uh, we fight AIDS. Farm access we heard about. What a, what a brilliant idea that still has tremendous currency, making sure that we understand the role of the private sector. There are no panaceas. There are no simple solutions in health. The private sector has a very important role, but we at the World Bank Group are working through a process where we come up with a way of ensuring that with private sector involvement, everyone gets access to treatment. Not easy. But uh, uh, Yup was definitely on the right path. And he was, he was one of the few who were saying, we've got to find a way to treat everybody. He said, if we can get cold Coca-Cola and beer to every remote corner of Africa, uh, it should be, not be impossible to do the same with drugs. Now, the Netherlands have been an extremely important contributor uh, to, uh, to global health. And I would, I would go as far as to say that this is a sweet spot. Uh, for the Netherlands. I was just uh, meeting with uh, Jeroen Dijsselbloem, the Minister of Finance, of course, and we talked about uh, uh, the role of, uh, of the Netherlands in global health. And it contributes to uh, you know, the, all of the... Uh, the you, everyone may not know the, um, uh, the acronyms. Global Fund, of course. Gavi is the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations. UNAIDS is the UN organization focusing on AIDS. And UNFPA is the family planning-focused organization. But the Netherlands has taken on the uncomfortable issue, sexual and reproductive health. And they've always, uh, they've been the ones funding it when uh, more conservative uh, governments have refused to. So where are we today? We've made progress. 17 million people on treatment. And you know, when we set the target of three by five, I, ba I basically took it all on myself. My team, I was head of HIV at the WHO, they said, don't do it, it's crazy, we'll never reach it. And I kept saying, why are you so against setting a target? And they said, well, well, you know, what if we don't make the target? And I said, what if we don't make the target? And they said, well, well then we'll be blamed. And I said, is that all? You're wor there are 25 million people about to die uh, from HIV, and what you're worried about is that we'll be blamed? And they said, yes. And what I said is, okay, let me tell you, uh, whether, if we don't reach the target, I will take all the blame personally. 
I will take every bit of the blame personally. You guys don't have to worry about it. Let's just work on trying to get this done. We didn't reach the target. We went from literally nobody, like 50,000 people in Africa were getting treated, and we were talking about 3 million in two and a half years. We didn't reach the target, but we got past a million, 1.1 million, and they reached the target just two years later. And I think in the history of the UN system, reaching a target two years later is about the best we've ever done. <laughs> but magical things happened, right? Uh, people, people did take the drugs. We uh, improved procurement systems. We improved uh, supply chain management systems. Uh, you know, these, these, once people saw uh, that, that you look like you're dying and then, uh, like Lazarus, you reemerge, uh, the demand started going up. Now, there's still work to do. Uh, UNAIDS says that 37 million are estimated to be living with HIV AIDS and 19 million don't know their status. So there's a lot of work to do. But the point is, and you knew this very well, he knew that we wouldn't have these drugs if there wasn't the activism. Now, on the left is the, the folks from ACT UP, right? These, are, these guys are, are my heroes, and they're still uh, with us, and they're still acting up, and they're still putting issues in front of us. This was one of the most uh, absolutely miraculous uh, social movements in history. You should all study about, th about this. But you can see this is much more recent, right? People are willing to take off their clothes to bring attention to this issue. Now, for the young people in the audience, I'm not telling you to take off your clothes to, uh, to do this, but it's an interesting experience if you do it. And it's a question of, it's a question of how important is it to you, right? How, how willing are you to really tackle the most important uh, issues of your time that will define you as a generation. I was saying to everyone who would listen at that time that if we allow 25 million people in Africa to die, that is what we will be remembered for. We will be remembered for that act. Luckily, we didn't do it, but it was close. It was very, very close. You know, uh, my, uh, my mother uh, is, a, is, a, is a philosopher, and uh, we moved to this country in 1964, uh, and I was five years old at the time. And when I was eight or nine or ten years old, uh, Martin Luther King, well, it was actually l younger than that, between 64 and 68, was when Martin Luther King really came into the consciousness uh, of, the, of, the, of the U.S. And uh, my mother had studied um, uh, theology at Union Theological Seminary, where some of the great social thinkers at the time were. And so she introduced me to Martin Luther King. Uh, he said, we are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. There's no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. And if there's one message that you take away from this talk, it's that this is happening every day. It's not like Martin Luther King identified um, uh, civil rights as an issue. He took care of it, and now we're past that. And now we don't have any issues like Martin Luther King tackled, that, that he was a historical uh, relic to be inspired by, but we don't have that. We have those issues everywhere. And it's the role of every generation to identify what those are and then find your own way to tackle them like, like Martin Luther King did, like the ACT UP folks have and continue to do. So, I think this is one of the things that exists in the world that is, as, and I, I use this, and, and, and you also use this language, I think this is a stain on our collective conscience that we have to tackle. This is stunting. So stunting, as I explained, two standard deviations below uh, height for age. But what we know is that these children, uh, and, and look at the rates, so uh, as high as 60%, right? And, and I'll show you the brain scans of stunted children, what they look like. Right, so these are children who are born to poor families and through absolutely no fault of their own because we have failed them collectively, they end up uh, with brains that do not function the same as their non-stunted peers. Uh, the rates have gone down, but look, look at Sub-Saharan Africa. We've gone from 44.8 million in 1990 and the number has actually gone up. Uh, the Middle East and North Africa rates have gone down. Latin American and Caribbean, the rates have gone down. East Asia and the Pacific, there used to be lots of stunted children in China, and that has dropped tremendously. But look at South Asia and look at Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, this is a, a problem of just enormous proportions. And what we know is that economic growth is not enough. So this, is, this was my argument when we wrote Dying for Growth. Growth alone will not solve this problem. And because you can see countries... Uh, uh, above, 
you can see the countries that are doing very well, relatively speaking, in terms of um, uh, 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 relatively well in terms of GNP per capita, but still have very high rates of stunting. India, I was just there, 38.7 percent of their children under five are stunted. Now, what does this mean? Uh, uh, schooling, they don't do as well in school. Early nutrition programs can increase school completion, but not very many of them exist in the world. Uh, earnings, we know that early income, uh, that early um, uh, nutritional programs increase adult wages. We know that it actually increases their wages. Poverty, escaping poverty, children who are not stunted uh, are 33% more likely to um, uh, escape poverty. And in, in, the, in terms of the economy, it can increase real GDP by 4 to 11 percent. So these are real numbers that we've studied, but still, we're not doing enough. The, the, um, and, and I have to say, I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone. I have not. This, it's only been recently that I've really taken this up, and, and, and it's, part of it is that this is the cover to a book called The Fourth Industrial Revolution uh, that was written by Klaus Schwab, the person who runs the uh, World Economic Forum. And in it, he says that the future is going to be that, that the fourth industrial revolution is the third industrial revolution on steroids. It's uh, not only is it going to be digital, but it's digital, it's going to be uh, uh, related to nanotechnology, 3D printing, um, uh, 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 artificial intelligence. And in order to compete in the economy of the future, you're going to need to have as many brain cells collectively as you possibly can. Everyone in your economy has to be digitally competent and has to be able to learn for their whole lives. At one point, one of my um, uh, colleagues at Dartmouth uh, told me that they did a survey, and after five years, uh, five years out of graduation, 40% of the graduates had jobs that did not exist when they graduated. Right? So this is a fast-moving culture. And... The other thing that we, that we under, began to realize is that agriculture is becoming more capital and technology intensive. Light manufacturing is becoming more capital and technology intensive. Um, Minister Dijsselbloem told me that there's the phenomenon of reshoring in the Netherlands, that light manufacturing that had gone to emerging markets is now coming back because it's more capital intensive and more technology intensive. So in other words, it doesn't even create a lot of jobs in the Netherlands, but it definitely takes jobs away from developing countries. So if low-skill agriculture and um, uh, light manufacturing, making t-shirts, is not available as a path to economic growth, a path which Korea followed, a path which many countries followed, including China, then what are people going to do? And what are people going to do, especially if they don't have the neural, neuronal infrastructure to compete? The first two years of life, so the first two years of life, um, this, the, 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 white, the lighter part is the first two years of life. So sensory pathways, language, and higher cognitive functions are all coming together in those first two years of life. So if you're stunted in those first, if you don't have nutrition, if you don't have appropriate stimulation, if you're in a toxic environment, you could be set back for the rest of your life and not make it up. These are brain scans of, on the left, a healthy child, and on the right, a stunted child. This is also new. We're able to look inside the brains of children in a way that we have not been able to before. The actual number of neuronal connections that these children have is fewer. Now, there is plasticity in the brain for, for the whole of one's life, but if you start off with a structure that is deficient, it is very difficult, and, and some would say impossible, to get all of that back. Now, uh, is it just a hopeless story? Is it a story like AIDS before 1996? And the answer is no. Peru, that, a place that I worked in uh, since starting in, 19, in the early 1990s, struggled with stunting. Decade after decade, 30%, 30%, 30%. And I was there. Tons of supply side, in other words, supplying services that didn't work. Finally, in uh, 2006, very recently, you can see it's very recently, we worked with them on a program that gave cash directly to poor women, but conditioned those cash transfers on doing those things for their children that would stop stunting. And it required lots of different effort, but they halved the rate of stunting in seven years. This is new. We've not seen this before. And now we understand better than ever before how to end childhood stunting. Now, uh, you have to have political commitment. You have to have multi-sectoral um, uh, uh, approaches. You have to have social workers, educational interventions, nutritional interventions. 
And what we found was the key was how you budget it. The finance part of it was critical. Uh, giving them money in order to take care of their children, which is good. Uh, we, we found that we, we've learned over many years that this is good for, for societies anyway. It's, it, it's what you hear call a social uh, safety net. It's, it's, you know, what an idea. Social safety nets for poor people. Uh, but we found that this actually works. Now, before we get on to the questions, I just want to make the case uh, that um, uh, there are many, many, many things uh, that we have to face with a sense of urgency. But the evidence has seemed to, you know, and I, I'm gonna, I have a PhD in anthropology, so we've studied, you know, all the, the, the great Marxist theorists, we've discovered, I mean, we've, uh, we've, we've studied all the uh, social theorists. And there was a time when the sense was that you had two ways of looking at the world. One is to equalize all outcomes. And this was communism. Just say everyone is the same, everyone has the same outcome. And the other was to depend on the market systems. I have to tell you, folks, that argument is over. And if you want to see why, uh, just how over that argument is, go to China and Vietnam. Because the communist regimes of China and Vietnam are the most dedicated to finding ways to make the market work for them of any governments I've ever seen. Because it is the water we swim in. So the question is not equalizing outcomes. The question has to be, how do we equalize opportunity? But for 25% of the children in the world today, inequality is literally baked into their brains. They're not going to be able to compete. This is something we have to tackle with great urgency. Now, um, as I've said before, we have to raise our ambitions so that they meet the level of the poor themselves. Now, back to Martin Luther King. Um, when he was arrested and in the Birmingham jail, he wrote this thing called uh, Letters from Birmingham Jail. And he, uh, he, he wrote about a letter that he received from what he called the white moderate. And we can read it together. All Christians know, this white moderate said, that the colored people will receive equal rights eventually, eventually. But it is possible that you are in too great a religious hurry. It has taken Christianity almost 2,000 years to accomplish what it has. The teachings of Christ take time to come to earth, to which Martin Luther King responded. Such an attitude stems from a tragic misconception of time and a strangely irrational notion that there is something in the flow of time that will inevitably cure all ills. Actually, time itself is neutral. It can be used destructively or constructively. More and more, I feel that the people of ill will have used time much more effectively than the people of goodwill. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. What will we have to repent for? I tell you, as a medical doctor, president of the World Bank, lending this year $60 billion, I will have to repent for not tackling this problem of childhood stunting. I will have to repent for not tackling the problem of climate change. You know, I have a, seven, I have a 16-year-old and a 7-year-old son. And my 16-year-old was in the back of the car, and he was saying, Dad, did you read about what's happening in Miami? Water is coming through the limestone. Miami is going to be underwater. You know, climate change is terrible. And then my 7-year-old, right, <laughs> sitting in the, in, the, in the back, said, Dad, why aren't you working more on climate change? Good question. Good question. Uh, this is going to get worse before it gets better. There, and, and, and I think that what Martin Luther King put in front of us is more relevant today than ever. What are the things that we will have to repent for if we don't tackle them? Take your pick. There are so many of them. Uh, learn, how, uh, learn how to do something really effectively. Get a skill. And then go after these problems with everything you had. Yup Langa said, nothing is impossible, especially if it's inevitable. And the things that looked impossible, like HIV treatment in 1996 and 2000, even in 2003, you could see that eventually everyone say, will say that it's inevitable that we've treated people because we can't be the generation that lets 25 million people die. We want to be remembered as a generation that insisted on HIV treatment. That's what Yup Langa was. That's what we will always remember him for. We will always remember him for being a scientist who thought about the private sector and the public sector and who insisted that all humans were in fact humans. And that there is, there is a very high cost 
to not acting on issues that are right in front of you today. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thanks very much, thank you, thank you, uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, thank you, thank you, so we'll, <clears throat> gosh, you know, I usually don't get standing ovations when I'm talking about <laughs> About, um, uh, uh, about reducing our budget at the World Bank, Christian, which you know we do, right? We watch our pennies very carefully. So uh, anyway, thank you. Um, Tracy? Oh, we get to sit. Oh, good. All right. Let me grab the water. Okay. What a rousing call to action, Dr. Kim. <laughs> Doctor, banker, and activist still. Yes, I, I hope so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have some questions for the audience from the audience. I'm sure there are also some questions from the audience that I don't know about yet. Mm -hmm. We'll hear about that in a moment. Um, I had a question uh, going back a little bit about you personally. How did you move from being a doctor to being the president of the World Bank Group? How did that happen? Well, it was, uh, you know, I, I was at Dartmouth, and I was uh, in just in my third year of being president of Dartmouth, and uh, I got a call from Timothy Geithner, who at the time was Secretary of the Treasury. And Tim, Tim was a friend. He was class of 1983 at Dartmouth, and, you know, any time that Tim had called me in the past, it was that he had a friend who wanted to get their kid into Dartmouth, so that's what I thought he was telling, telling about. So I had a pen. I was going to write down the name of the kid, and I was going to say, I'll do my best, Tim. And he called, and he said, hey, Jim, how would you like to be president of the World Bank? And I said, what? You mean the World Bank? He said, yeah. I said, you know, I wrote a whole book uh, against the World Bank. He says, yeah, <laughs> not an issue. And I said, so what do I need to do? He said, why don't you come down and see President Obama? And I said, when? He said, how about tomorrow? Because <laughs> there, was, there was pressure to put up a nomination. And so um, I went down and I saw President Obama. And um, I went into, the, into his office and he said, um, he said, so Jim, why should I nominate you? to be president of the World Bank because you're a doctor and an anthropologist and you know uh, people are telling me that I should nominate a macroeconomist or a banker. Why should I choose you? And so I had been um, obsessed with uh, Barack Obama since 2004 when he made that speech and partly because his mother was an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. So without, without hesitating, I said to President Obama, President Obama, have you read your mother's thesis? Right? <laughs> and he said, well, yeah, I have because I had ordered her thesis from the University of Michigan archives, and I was like probably one of five people who've read it in the world, right? So I said, you'll remember, President Obama, that your mother argued that while everyone was saying that globalization would destroy local artisans in Indonesia, she actually showed that uh, globalization led to an explosion of the artisanal industry in Indonesia. And I said, you know, I'm not gonna give you the 30,000 macro view, but I've been on the ground working with people all my life, and I'll tell you how we're doing from the perspective of the poor. He looked at me and he said, I get that. A few days later, he nominated me. I was in, in the Rose Garden. And then later, uh, we were having a drink together with some, some people, and President Obama said, you know, Jim, that was one of the greatest ploys to get a job I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Read the president's mother's thesis. <laughs> That's actually how it happened. One of your uh, favorite sayings, Dr. Kim, is that optimis optimism is a moral choice when you're working in development. Right. What message would you give those of us in addition to the very inspiring talk that you just gave? Well, Christian said it. You know, he said he's an optimist because if you're in charge of a, the World Bank and you walk into settings and you're cynical and pessimistic, that is the reality that will, that will take shape, right? So, Power, for powerful people in the face of poverty to be pessimistic and cynical will lead to uh, programs failing. Right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, you know, 
it's not, you can do all kinds of analyses. Look at the analysis that the World Bank did based on real data, real information about Korea. They condemned it. They said that it would never grow. And then what happened afterwards, right? So I actually uh, was reading a lot. I, I did my PhD dissertation in Korea. And uh, I was reading the sort of revisionist economic analysis of why Korea succeeded, right? So what did they say? Well, it's too Confucian, not enough Western influence, uh, low education levels. So um, after, after they became successful, the, the new analysis was it was Confucian values that led to the growth of Korea, right? <laughs> so uh, I, I think that, that anyone in development has to, has to come to the table with a sense that everyone in the world wants to live like we do. And, and uh, you know, it may take some time, uh, but you, you, if your aspirations are low, and look, you know, when we were working on multidrug resistant tuberculosis and HIV, it wasn't, you know, it would have been interesting if it was just bemused um, uh, sort of uh, dismissal. But that's not what it was. It was anger. Right? And part of it was people were saying, if this was possible, we would have done it. What the hell are you saying? Are you saying that you're more moral than we are? And this, these are the kinds of arguments we had uh, around HIV treatment, because they were saying, it's not possible, it's not possible. And you know, um, uh, one of my favorite authors, Tracy Kidder, who wrote a book about uh, the, uh, Paul Farmer, the guy that I founded uh, Partners in Health with, Tracy said to me one day, he said, you know, I look at you guys just running around the world in the slums of Peru, in Haiti, saying that you can do this, you can do that, and I'm just like, the cynicism comes out in me, but then I realized that cynicism is the last refuge of the coward. That's a big compliment. <laughs> well said. We have a question from uh, Maureen Mungao. Maureen, where are you? Yes, Maureen, could you stand up? Your question is about HIV AIDS, tell us. Yeah, I'm Maureen, I'm a student at the International Institute of Social Studies. Um, my question yeah, is about HIV, and my main concern is about the work, the campaign that is going around uh, in combating HIV. So most attention has been given to women. As you see, like policies are all directed towards combating hate, HIV AIDS, and women have been given so much attention <laughs> that I'm wondering why are men left out in these campaigns? Yet HIV, as it's known, is largely um, spread by through hetero heterosexual transmission is the largest like spread of HIV AIDS. And as you see, that is, okay, according to the documentations, m women are given the attention because of their vulnerability to HIV. But then again, when you look at the mortality rates, the mortality rates of men are higher than women. So what is the World Bank doing to help the men in combating HIV AIDS? Well, so <clears throat> let, let me put it this way. I, I, I haven't heard this before, that, um, that men are being ignored but it would be like the first time in history that that's the case, right? <clears throat> and so I don't mind that uh, we're making a preferential option for women, as it were, uh, but I, I, you know, I'm not involved in, in uh, direct HIV planning. We do provide some, some support for countries that ask us for it, but um, I, I'm not on that side of it anymore, so I don't know the answer, but I do know that when, we were, when I was leading the HIV AIDS department at, uh, at WHO, our biggest worry our biggest worry is that there would be a huge gender imbalance in access to treatment and only the men would get it, right? So we made every effort to focus specifically <clears throat> on ensuring that women had access to treatment. So I, if that's gone overboard, I, I, I actually don't know, and maybe there would be people in the, uh, uh, in the audience who will know better. But, um, uh, you know, just about everything else in the world works against women. Right. So if there is one area where women have uh, even a temporary advantage, right, um, it makes me happy. I'm sorry. I, you know, so, it, you know, it's, it, it makes me happy in the sense that, that, I, that you're telling me that since 2003 and 2006, which is when I was at the World Health Organization, we made that one of our top priorities, that women would not be left behind. So it makes me happy that women were not left behind. Certainly, if, we, if more needs to be done to bring the men in, then, then uh, um, I, I, you know, I will pass that on to the people at the World Bank who work on HIV. One of the projects of the Ublonga Institute, Dr. Kim, which I know you're familiar with, is the health wallet. 
Hmm. It's a, a, a digital wallet yep. in which the patients themselves can put money for their health care, yeah. which is also matched. <coughs> it cannot be used for other purposes. It's a fascinating new use of technology. And that's why I wanted to go to Ugo Moruzzi. Ugo, tell us your question. Oh, well, first of all, I want to thank you for the inspirational sp speech you, or the, the presentation you gave. But uh, my question was about the fact that you mentioned that the fourth digital revolution could uh, actually cause problems for uh, people to get equalized uh, opportunities. And my question is, is actually uh, if technology could help actually um, reach people who are not uh, treated by the public uh, health, health systems uh, by using actually technology. What is your opinion about that? Yeah, I, you know, there's no question <clears throat> that, uh, f for example, the digital wallet, this is based on really great evidence, right? And it was a low-tech intervention in which we learned it. So what we did, uh, what uh, we were, I think, peripherally involved in, but there was a study that gave um, uh, poor women in Africa uh, just li little lock boxes. And it, it, uh, all it was was just you have a box and you have a little piece of paper and you record the money you put away into that box to use for health. And that made a difference. In other words, uh, the use of uh, uh, bed nets for malaria went up by a, with a very simple innovation. So this wallet, digital wallet, it makes perfect sense. Now, you know, um, one of the things we've also learned, and, and again, it's a, it's, it's a gender equality issue. One of the things we learned is that if you give conditional cash, cash transfers to men, a very high proportion of those projects fail. But if you give it to the women, a very high proportion of the projects, almost all of them, succeed. <clears throat> so, and, and it's crazy, and this is what I mean by gender equality, because we, can't, we make that mistake over and over and over again. We start by giving it to the men, and we learn, oh gosh, it's better to give it to the women. We've known this for three decades, but we keep making the mistake again and again. Now, uh, one of the things that is very interesting is in India, more than a billion people have been registered with biometric identification. 12-digit number, 10 fingerprints, 2 iris prints. And so all it does is that it says the person who brought this 12-digit number in and gave you that fingerprint is that person. So you link that to accounts, and you can move money directly uh, to poor people instead of going through the layers of the Indian Administrative Service. So I think there's no question that, that, that we can uh, use technology in very important ways. But the fundamental question still remains, what are they going to do? What kind of jobs are they going to do? What is economic growth going to look like? Uh, are they prepared uh, for competition in what will certainly be a much more complex, much more digital economy? And we have to take that on. So in the meantime, use every single kind of, uh, uh, of, of technology to help uh, equalize outcomes. I think in education, there's so many online systems that are, in fact, better than, uh, than most teachers. I mean, you know, it, one of the things that we heard at, uh, at Dartmouth was that eventually, probably two people will teach the whole world calculus. Because calculus is hard to teach. And there are going to be people who are just better at it than anyone else. Uh, Sal Khan, I mean, I do Sal Khan, Khan Academy uh, videos myself, right? My kids use them. He's one of the great teachers that exist in the world. And, you know, he, he, he didn't start off as being a teacher. So I think there are ways of using technology to help but um, it doesn't solve the question of what are they going to do. We have a question from <coughs> Richard Boer, which I think is very relevant for our talk about the role of the private sector. Uh, hello, I'm Richard Boer. And my question is, why are innovations in healthcare so slow to enter a market, and what can we do about that? That's a great question. <clears throat> so uh, that's actually what I was doing. That's the problem I was focused on before I went to the World Bank. Because um, for an, in, in the United States, for a new health innov <laughs> innovation that is proven, that's on the market, to reach the majority of, uh, of people in the country, in the United States, it takes 17 years. Right? So even in the United States, innovations are slow uh, uh, to, to, to spread. And it was even more um, uh, uh, pronounced in developing countries. So uh, my, my theory, and it's still what we're working on, is that we needed a science focused on implementation and delivery. In many ways, it's what the Yuplang Institute does, tries to find ways of, of taking the things we already have and delivering them better. Now, the structure of academia is extremely um, uh, prejudiced against that kind of research because it's, it's too pedestrian. 
trying to figure out how to make sure that everyone uses a certain you know, new medicine for cardiology, you know, uh, ACE inhibitors, a particular kind of medicine that we found had tremendous impact uh, in patients with congestive heart failure. It should have been used everywhere in the United States immediately, but it took 15 years for everyone to really use it. Right? So how do you, if that's the case in the US, how do you make it better in developing countries? So I started something at Dartmouth called uh, the Center for Healthcare Delivery Science. And uh, it just, these, are, these are fashions in academia, right? Um, uh, right now, the fashion in academia is everyone needs to do molecular biology research. And then after that, everyone needs to do clinical research where we compare one, uh, one thing to another. But delivery research, wow, that's hard because you have to look at systems, you have to look at leadership and teamwork and all these things that in academia are seen as really not very uh, intellectually rigorous. Uh, but I think it's going to make the most difference. So... Uh, I tried to do that at Dartmouth, but it was so hard. And so now at the World Bank, we formed um, uh, uh, global practices that their job is to find the best innovations to tackle problems all over the world and then spread them. Right? So uh, the Peru example I gave you, right? uh, uh, you're not going to get tenure at a, at a major university, meaning you know lifelong appointment, or you're going to get kudos in a university for studying how the Peruvians reduce their, um, their, their stunting by half in seven years. You're not going to win any kudos, but it's maybe the most important research for children that you can imagine. So we're going to do it. We're going to bring those results together, and the Peruvian example will be made available to everyone in the world. And so I, I actually think that the diffusion of innovation, which is the way they refer to it, <clears throat> is something that we at the World Bank Group can really, um, uh, we, we can really uh, uh, contribute to because we're not a university. It's, it's, you know, we're, we're much less um, subject to the whims of, uh, of, uh, of academia. We have time for, I think, two more questions, and I would like to give the floor to <coughs> Robert van Heert. It's an interesting question about sustainability. Okay. Thank you very much for your lecture. Um, I have the question that, according to the UN expectations, our world population will reach the 10 billion mark by 2056. Now, 10 million who we all want to provide with education, <coughs> nutritious food, and safety, of course. Yet, our planet does not grow with us, and therefore, it begs the question, is our current path towards global health and development sustainable? Well, um... You know, a actually, nothing is sustainable unless you make it sustainable, right? So uh, what, what are, one of the lessons we've learned over the years is that if the first few children are healthier, if there's economic growth, and there's the sense that you're going to have some stability in your life, you have fewer children, right? So um, uh, it, 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 what part of moving aggressively toward making sure that every child is healthy is that we would like to, we'd like to see if we can lower the birth rate, right? I mean, the, the very, very large families that uh, extremely poor people have is a burden on them as well. But part of the, 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 the uh, phenomenon, and some people say, well, they just, they're having too many children. Well, what we know is that, the, 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 that as economic development kicks in, the birth rate goes down, and it's happened literally in every country in the world, right? So um, uh, it's good to be worried about it, but then the question for you is, what are you going to do to make sure that you build that sustainable world? And for me, uh, you know, um, we're involved in, in, in fragility and conflict everywhere, right? And we're, we're looking to the Middle East and North Africa. We're working in Africa, and there's fragility and conflict. And why is there fragility and conflict? It's not... It's not 100% related to poverty. Uh, there are religious differences, there are ideological differences, but a whole lot of it is related to poverty. Let me just give you an example. Um, um, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who was the president of Liberia, said that I have um, uh, millions of, uh, um, of, of men who've done nothing, not millions, hundreds of thousands and more than a million men who've done nothing their entire lives except be soldiers. What do I do with them? Now, you're born to a very poor family, you've got no options, and a militia says, why don't you join us? There are many that are joining those militias because there's nothing else for them to do. So the task of creating opportunity, the task of making sure that people have the capital to create jobs, to be entrepreneurs, uh, if we don't do that, the world is going to be much, much less sustainable. Right? Uh, 
So, you know, some people say, well, why are you doing all those things? Why don't we just ignore it, <clears throat> and then maybe <clears throat> it'll go away. Stop foreign assistance. It's not worth it. Let's just focus on ourselves. Well, I can guarantee you that if that's the path we take, it will be much, much worse. Uh, you will have, in every country in the world, um, lots of young people who uh, don't have a- appropriate nutrition, don't have good education, who don't have any prospects in life. And what have we learned from the refugee crisis here in uh, Europe. It's that Africa is very close. The problems <clears throat> of the Middle East and North Africa are very close to Europe, right? And they're very close to all the developed countries. We cannot move toward a fortress mentality. I think the only hope is that uh, in, in a multilateral way with many different countries, with many different nations of the world, we decide that the only morally defensible path is to try to create equality of opportunity for everyone. And then let's take it from there. That's my view. Another call to arms. What are you going to do? We are coming to the end of our time together, Dr. Kim. Uh, We have a small gift for you, and that's going to be given to you by Natasha Konstam, one of the group of students that we have with us today. And, you know, for the non-students, sorry you didn't get to ask questions, but... uh, I prefer it this way. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Natasha, what is what is your takeaway from today? It was so inspirational. Oh, thank you. I can say for all the students and for all the people here, I think. That you're such an inspiration, and I hope to receive a call like that to become the <laughs> director of the World Bank, of course. So I will do my best at school. <laughs> thank you. That's great. But That's thank great. You very thank, much. You. thank you. Thank you. We've come to the end of our event. I want to thank the Yuplonga Institute for making it possible to host Dr. Kim for the Yuplonga lecture. I think this will remain with many of us for a long time. Please allow rows four and five to leave first. And it remains for me only to thank you myself from the bottom of my heart for this inspiration. Thank you you so much. Thank you. Thank you. If some of the students want a picture, I'd be happy.